I don't want any more allies. Where are the accomplices? You should sharpen the guillotines, but that's just me. I think it is the issue with teaching people not to oppose a system, but to oppose their place in a system. What they do to allow for homophobia to run rampant is they make it white. Not that that's all cishet men. Most cishet men are taught to dissect themselves from their emotional selves. All cishet that. men. Let's call it what it really is. You unfoundedly hate me or dislike me. So you are transmissic. You're homomissic. So my question is, who gonna throw the first brick? I am so glad to have y'all for my first queer Olay and Friends convening. I had said I was going to, I'm going to do it on a, on a regular basis. People have been like, oh, you should make a queer Olay and Friends for, for Pride Month. I was like, or... I can just do that regularly, not regu Period. relegated to pride. <laughs> like, uh, yes. And honestly, it turns out I have the longest list. I have a longer list of uh, black queer commentators and public figures that I than I have anything else. Like, this is the easiest thing to do. I was like, I have so many people. I'm just going to convene a group with uh, great chemistry that I like. So because I wanted to hear from y'all. Honestly, you're going to have the best, most apt takes. And I think everybody, especially in my space, is going to rush to have a bunch of um, cis straight, the straight people talk about, you know, lament about the woe is me. Of a lot. I'd rather not. I was like, let me hear from the people themselves and bring it and moderate this and bring that there. So yeah. I'm so glad to have y'all. It's good to be Happy here. To be here. Yeah. We, we love you. And it's I'm, glad glad it's so yeah. I'm glad to be here. Oh, We're like the gay people. Avengers. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> I about to theme it like that. <laughs> yes. No, but yeah, y'all had y'all had the y'all had the takes. Like, and honestly, I really, I really wanted to hear from y'all because here's the thing. This is a kangaroo court. I there's really mm -hmm. no need for any of us to even act surprised. We should be outraged every time. But surprise. Not at mm -hmm. all. This has been, this is, and they're going to keep doing this. Every time they get an opportunity, we're going to see a rollback and a rollback. And I was talking to my friend today, like, you know, America's honestly getting to the point where they're about a couple of law, a couple of rights away from you got to get a, you got to have to get a flight and leave. It's, gonna, it's getting that bad legitimately. I think it is going to be a mass exodus because basically all they're trying to do is use the court to legitimize homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, every kind of phobia they could get into they're getting into. And so I basically wanted the thoughts from the people that's going to impact the most first, you know, because they come in for everybody. And I think that's something people forget. They think you, they think when you ask them to be in, I, that's why I kind of want to get rid of ally. Um, they think it's like doing a favor for other people, as opposed to the fact that if they come for you in the morning, they're coming, they're coming for you at night. You see what I'm saying? I'm like, they're coming for LGBTQ persons first, hmm. first, they're in the open with it first, but it doesn't end there. So yeah, I kind of wanted to put that to the floor. Hmm. You know, you know, I have a lot of thoughts always. Um, and <laughs> I think that for me, when I first read about the court's ruling, honestly, I'm not going to hold you. I laughed because it was just like, girl, of course, like, like what else are y'all going to do? Like, y'all bored, y'all, y'all be in the house doing nothing else. Like, what else are you going to do? Of course, this is what you're going to do. And I also laughed because. I think that black trans and black queer folks for the longest have been talking about like how same sex marriage in particular has always been a very cis white gay fight. And they felt like, oh, you know, we've locked in this this right to get married. So things are done. Right. Meanwhile, disproportionately, black trans folks, black trans women in particular are being murdered. Right. Meanwhile, folks can't even use particular bathrooms. Meanwhile, black gays are being mugged on the streets. Right. Like, meanwhile, majority of our black homeless youth are LGBT. Right. Like. And none of that mattered to these people because they got the chance to get married, to to, to assimilate into this very cis white supremacist patriarchal institution right and so i i laughed i was like okay i mean a court and its rulings were never going to be able to give or take away any particular rights to niggas in the first place because niggas don't have rights like what exactly like what exactly are we are we even trying to feign some sort of like 
sadness or 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 surprise for right we know for a fact that these people have never engaged us as full human beings who ever had access to any of the particular rights that they passed or re- or repealed in the first place um and i think that like where i'm always where i always land is at the fact that if nine people or six of nine people can determine whether or not you have a right to exist in the first place, you don't actually have a right to exist. Like, so, so now we have to actually talk about where exactly you land in the the sort of caste or the, or the hierarchy of rights to exist and babes, you don't have that right. So now what I am on the side of Jane Fonda. If you know, you know. Sister Girl said the next step is murder. And I'm on her side. I I stand with her. Period. I'm with her. Like, because these courts, they were they're never gonna rule in our favor. This is always why I was like, y'all are like going up for homegirl who just got um put in office. I don't remember her name, Katanji. The, the, yeah, like you know, they were very, very they were going up for her. I'm like are we aware of what the Supreme Court does? Are we clear about exactly what they have to be committed to in order to to sit in that office? And of course, she was one of the, the three who voted against um, Lori Smith is the woman's name, um, that ruling. But it's still the Supreme Court. Like, and yeah. you want the Constitution to recognize you as something that the Constitution says you are not. So now what? So that's where I landed. That's the, I was like, all right, what's next? Um, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, I, was, I just want to say something, but I'm not trying to get put on more FBI watch lists. <laughs> okay. I will say, sharpen the guillotines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, uh, no, nah, I think white supremacy is so insidious in its connectivity and how often white people, like, I love that Deshaun pointed out, like, how specifically white, queer, cis people are so willing to, like, just throw the rest of us under the bus Mm -hmm. uh, to secure these, honestly, like, meaningless rights, um, like marriage. Like, not that it's meaningless overall, but meaningless in the grand scheme of, like, what impacts queer people on a daily basis. Um, I was not shocked by this at all. I honestly think that it is about to get much worse. Um, and the next step for me, for what I see, is like them trying to end birthright right citizenship so they can dictate who is and who isn't a citizen. Because, oh, yeah. like, so much. Yeah. Um, because so much of, um, like, the way slavery works in this country still works in this country uh, contends on, like, your rights as a citizen. And if they can strip that right from all of us, they can really do whatever it, whatever they want. Um, and I think, like, we've seen this, like, iteration, like, many times, like, in the prison industrial complex. And I think they're just shifting the, the goalposts, which is what they do all the time. But that is the insidiousness of white supremacy. Um, and, yeah, I do, I do really land on every time we should sharpen the guillotines. But that's just me. Usually, <laughs> I was saying that revolution was around the corner because it was clearly a cascading effect. Like, they, it was so orchestrated the way that it was back to back to back with the affirmative action and then this, and then a year ago, Roe v. Wade. And every time, I mean, echoing what Deshaun has been saying, for years, Black queer folk have been saying this is going to happen. For years, right? Specifically, Black trans women have been saying this is going to happen for years. And people thought shit was sweet when they, they thought shit was sweet when Obama got in office, right? Same-sex marriage, all of that, all of it, right? Yeah. Uh, pussy walks or I forgot what it was called when a white woman had to, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, they, but they thought shit was sweet. And then Trump gets elected and that's a shocker. And literally the moment it's like, we're saying this is all going to happen and people didn't believe us. And it's like, it's like white women, white cis women and white queer folk are the most shocked and surprised and flabbergasted. But it's like, we're regressing in a way that of course is what happened. I don't understand why you think that it wouldn't. And it's 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 given very much like they're attacking people that like, but by the end of it, it's going to come back to people who have already kind of been hurt regardless. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, the rights that were passed weren't really helping us anyways. So imagine how much worse it's going to get when they really start actually attacking us. And um, 
I too am am agreeing with bringing the, the guillotines back. Um, <laughs> let me not I say, think I'll raise say something crazy. <laughs> But the, the the funniest part about this to me, and I think that the part that nobody is talking about is the fact that queer people have been saying these things for years. The only time that folks have found them interesting enough to listen to is when a cishet ally activist-esque person hops onto their platform and says, oh, like, as an ally, as a, you know, whatever, but like, I agree with Olay. I don't want any more allies. Where are the accomplices? Because at this point, I need you to come and do the damage with me or get the fuck out of my way and keep all of your performance for whatever awards you're trying to get, for whatever acknowledgement from whatever TV company you're trying to draw up or whatever. And that's not to say that these people don't genuinely care about queer people. But I also understand that in the world of becoming the next social media activist, star, person, whatever, that there are perks that come with being able to speak on certain topics in the affirmative. But the thing about it is for you, it's a topic. For me, it is life or death. And the sad part about it is that even queer people have fallen victim to this idea of upholding or uplifting these folks that are not in the margins with you that barely understand the surface level arguments but we're propelling those things over the people that are working on grassroots you know efforts over the queen jeans over the raquel willis's over the folks that are like really out here organizing and creating the space and so i think that the reason why it's not just a shock just for the white cis heads and the white you know, queer folks but a shock for a lot of the like the black people who have been doing the work is because your idea of doing the work is propelling the messages and the voices of people who don't know what the work is or where to start. They've just been regurgitating the arguments from the people that are actually doing it and hoping that something lands. And I, I don't know. I just feel like another thing is we need to point to their playbook. I mean, they're going after LGBTQ rights, and it's also attached to the rights against uh, contraception, the rights against abortion. Because, you know, in 2018, uh, the white population was at 60 percent compared to 90 percent in 1950. So there's a lot of fear and it's rooted in like fascism and, and it's expected that it will fall under 50 percent in 25 years. So they're attacking us from all different different parts just so they can keep their majority just so they can keep us under just so they can keep us below because we know what they want to do they want this to be a white state they want this to be a white country but we're i don't know what we're going to do i don't know how we're going to get there but i would like that if we just defined exactly and be real about what the fuck is going on in this country right now and you know go ahead Ole. go ahead no 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 you you deshaun <laughs> i was I just gonna <laughs> <laughs> i was just gonna say that i think that this is This is, for me, the very frustrating part of, like, witnessing conversations that just don't drive us anywhere because people really don't understand the pervasiveness of anti-Blackness, right? Mm -hmm. And the pervasiveness of anti-Blackness, the thing that makes anti-Blackness so particularly violent is that you can't write anti-Blackness into or out of practice. It is a practice Mm -hmm. that exists and therefore allows for things like this to be written into and out of law, right? Right. Lawmaking does not end or or begin anti-Black practices, right? And I think that like, this is my frustration with liberalism, with neoliberalism, because people have invested so much of their time into electoral politics, right, that under this this premise or this idea that if we can vote someone in or out of a seat that somehow our our lives are changed or 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 we're we're saved that we have access to to better things access to resources that we didn't have access to before as if we did not sit under 8 years of Barack Obama as if Atlanta does not exist right now and has not existed with with a, a black mayor for over 50 years that has mm-hmm. been rapidly gentrifying and pushing out its black residents, right? I've lived mm-hmm. in Atlanta for a decade. I know very intimately what black misleadership's relationship to its black residents look like, right? Atlanta has a really packed black APD, right? Our, our police officers are many of them are black, right? They're the ones who are arresting us in the streets. They're the ones who are harassing us in the streets. They're the ones who are making sure that we don't get to make it to the streets or out of the streets, right? The black police officers, the black mayor, the black DA, right? And so, you know, for me, it's like, 
I think more people should be really focused on Atlanta politics because I think that it disrupts everything about what we have been taught to believe about about representation. Exactly, precisely, right? Yeah. 96, the 96 Olympics, even before them really, but the 96 Olympics in Atlanta cemented driving out homeless folks and black folks in the city of Atlanta and has set a precedent for how black folks would be engaged in Atlanta if you're not an affluent person, if you're not a black celebrity, right, who oftentimes, to be clear, live on the outskirts. They call, they say they're from Atlanta or they live in Atlanta, but Omretta the Great, she made some points. Some of these niggas is not Atlanta. <laughs> some of these niggas is not Atlanta. <laughs> no tea, no shade. Um, because they don't they don't live in the city anymore, and and then you get Ti and Killer Mike who stand beside police officers, who stand mm-hmm. beside Keisha Lance Bottoms, who stand beside Andre Dickens, and are like, this is a Wakanda, and we got to treat it like a Wakanda, and that means locking up niggas, that means pushing out niggas, right? And so to me, it's like when you when you live in that environment every single day, when you organize and you engage in movement every single day for a decade under black misleadership. The kind of things that happen on a federal level just feel like exactly that makes sense to me. It makes sense to me that you would would write in write these laws into practice or repeal these laws that have allegedly been protecting some people and their rights. You know, the people who are recognized as people and their rights. It makes sense that you would do that because we don't understand the pervasiveness pervasiveness of anti-blackness. And we Mm -hmm. think that as long as those laws exist or don't exist, that we're protected. And I just got to say, I've been watching niggas be murdered every, every single day, almost, it feels like, yeah, for 10 years by black police officers under a black regime, yeah. if, if you want to call it that, in a dying empire. Yeah. Mm. The some studies say, no, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to say that some studies say, um, in the end of, end of policing in that book, there's a study that says, tip like, there have been studies showing that police brutality is worse sometimes against people of color and black people when there are black police officers. And people seem to forget that whiteness, yes, it's your race, like race, phenotype, phenotype, all of that, but whiteness and white supremacy is literally an ideology. It's like a cult. It's something you can subscribe to. And you do not have to be white to subscribe to the ideologies of whiteness, of white supremacy. And one of the ways I literally was just arguing in in my comments with black folk literally today and yesterday about how pervasive homophobia and queer phobia is in our community mm-hmm. and that is such a pillar of white supremacy that they don't even yeah. see that they're echoing the same the same the tools as massa the it's in the playbook meanwhile black people we have never been included in in the definitions of masculinity the definitions of femininity of womanhood of manhood of sexuality the heteronormativity we have literally always been outside of those definitions so to be so tied to the definitions that it literally exclude us we have yeah. black women who are being excluded from sports right now because god forbid they have different testosterone levels they're mm. not they're not considered a woman yeah and you want to be transphobic you want to you you're literally spewing the same exact things and that is exactly how they're getting us and if you think as a black community as black folk that we could all be free but black queer folk can't be free and black trans mm-hmm. folk can't be free, then you're literally delusional. It's just, I, I, if you look at the backbone of so many of our like civil rights movements, who have been, who have been there? If not people black queer will people. People will pull Angela Davis at you while they being homophobic. I had some, yo, they, 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 they have the no idea <laughs> what they be talking about. They be killing me when they say that. I'm like, I can't, more often than not, both historically and present day, when I think of Black activists or Black scholars or, or, or Black leaders, they're queer. Three out of five times, they are past and present. I told you at the beginning of this, it was easier for me to go through a list of queer people, queer, like Black queer people that could talk than, than cis straight people. It's much harder for me to convene that panel. And I think, you know, I think there's something to 
I think this kind of exposes several problems. One, I think it is the issue with teaching people not to oppose a system, but to oppose their place in a system. I think that's the problem with how we go about capitalism, how we go about so many of these institutions in our society. Like you'll find so many black people, they are not mad at capitalism. They are mad at where they're placed in capitalism. In the same way, you see them, they're not mad at these oppressive structures. They're not mad at hegemony. They're not mad at patriarchy. They're not mad at misogyny. They're mad at the way it's weaponized against them. And so it really allows them a different opportunity for queer people to subjugate a group underneath them themselves. It, to me, it's, it's right. a lot like people going to go exercise control they don't have otherwise in society. And I also think the second thing is, again, back to the, the favor thing is, you know, I think people are so, it's funny, people are selfish. They really are. And I think, and, and I think targeting and addressing that would help us a lot more, but everybody is both selfish and dishonest. Like they want to believe, especially I find this with like, I find this in the white nonprofit industrial complex every day is white people wanting to advocate to white people as though white people aren't white. Like, like, oh, all this talk about caring and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, they don't give a fuck about that. Why don't you tell them how much it costs them and how they come in for them after? I'm like, there are a lot. And I think in the same way, like we said, black people, non, non-white people are just as capable and every day, all day become, you know, harbingers of white supremacy and misogyny and all these different things. And I think that's what you see uh, with them when you try to tell them, hey, caring about my queer brothers and sisters or my queer non-binary folk, they don't give a fuck. But I think when you when you more so point out, hey, you see how your, your transphobia, look what's happening here, because you know that's going to get you right. as a cis black woman that's never been included in femininity right. or womanhood or any of that, but they don't get it. Yeah, and we see that I, in a lot of I, different uh, places. Sorry, I was going to say, we just see that in a lot of different places, especially with the separation of the LGBT from the T, when Black Americans are extremely, extremely homophobic, when you go all the way back to when Black men were getting the right to vote with the 15th Amendment and they were trying to leave women out, including Susan B. Anthony and her compadres, but also Black women. And we had to wait years and years until the 19th Amendment to even got any kind of recognition and the right to vote in this country. So we see that separation many, many times. And what was what was it that you said, Olay, about their place in the system, but not rejecting the system? Can you say that one yeah, more time? They, yeah, their problem is not the system. Their problem is where they fall in the system. Exactly. Um, mm. yeah. I want to just, oh, sorry. Go ahead, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to. Uh, I, I feel like I would lose my license if I don't bring into the room in the conversation trauma and how trauma is passed down and like how black people are in a very abusive relationship with uh, this uh, very much so anti black capitalist state. Um, yes. And it starts off to, like one, let's not get started on how, and Christina, you do a lovely job of talking about this a lot, but like how, like, uh, how white white people have such a deeply embedded like traumatized way of enact uh interacting with the world around them and they just like enact violence on everyone else around them and, and mm. that is a result of that shit they had going on can i curse on here yes of course <laughs> that, shit that, that shit that they had going on over there in europe and they brought that to the rest of us even though we did not need that um and they just like deeply internalized that and i think that has a lot to do with the way that they they structure their systems um and why i think that a lot of the black people who do try to uh buy into these like larger like 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 a vote ain't ever did shit to change my material reality i'm so sorry Facts. thank you Deshaun. but um like i think a lot of people buy into it because it is like an abuse of relationship and i do think that they inherit a lot of things like uh homophobia transphobia and things like that through misinformation but also the internalized result of being traumatized there are four trauma responses and i think the black people who really like i gotta call them boot lickers i'm so sorry like the, the black people who, who lick boots and who really try to like sit at the lap of white supremacy and like really feed into these like very like transphobic homophobic uh fucking cis uh, cis heteronormative standards of living who are constantly like bickering and attacking other black people online policing other black people and how uh, other black people maneuver through a very anti-black world those people inherited trauma i believe that they are doing a, if you ask me i i know a fond response when i see one um when you try so much uh to basically like take parts of and earn respect from uh your your oppressor your person who is abusing you and i think that a lot of black people are just wrapped up in that if you want me to be honest and uh i think these systems right 
there's this interesting thing like where it's like such an emphasis like and i think Deshaun, you covered it like such an emphasis on voting right if six people like and don't <laughs> if, if jenna got three apples like that's how i feel <laughs> hearing this conversation because if six people have the power to literally make it legal you know, without repercussions from an already homophobic and transphobic state to discriminate mm-hmm. against like people who who come from our community. What the fuck does that tell you about the state of this of this of this society? And mm. and you know what's crazy? I think like white I think the way I hear people talk about, especially black people, if you think about me and Laverne had this conversation recently when it came to like if you look at like the Dave Chappelle's like what they do what they do to allow for homophobia to run rampant is they make it white they erase black queer people Mm -hmm. all together and they make it this conversation about like whiteness and that's why they always I feel like they always center white queer people and what come off as like white trivial things and that allows people to believe the queer community is far better off than it has ever been because they're looking again still at mainstream whiteness Mm -hmm. rather than anything else hope but I, I, I so because th- y'all are saying a bunch of different things, I'm trying to like catch them all. So first and foremost, I want to like in- introduce Missia into the conversation rather than phobia. And I want to introduce that because a lot of the times folks will sit back and say like phobia means that I'm afraid. It does not simply mean that you're afraid. But let's 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 create a new space for some new words, right? Like so, transmissia and homomissia, meaning the hatred or unfounded disdain for, right? Like okay, there's a lot of that going on. And whenever people are like, oh, I'm not afraid of you. You know what? You you might not be afraid of me. So let's call it what it really is. You unfoundedly hate me or dislike me. So you are mm. transmissic. You're homomissic. You're all of those things. Mm. But beyond that, what I also want to call out when it comes down to that is that Black folk are not... Black folk are not unaware of the fact that Black queer people are still in the same space. What I think that they like to do is woefully disregard the fact, right, that we are still Black. Because what what I'll notice is that in a conversation where a person might not recognize or, or, or see my transness, whatever the fuck that means, right away, all of the things that I'm discussing about being a Black woman are received well, they're amen, I'm getting the same auntie, sister, cousin energy. The second that you you find out that I'm trans now all of a sudden you have to disagree with me right Mm -hmm. and it's because to make anything else that you've said that you believe palpable and true in this moment now you have to renege on my blackness right and center my queerness so that now you don't look like an ass when you say that the thing that I just said the thing that you just said that you agree with me on is now a problem and it's the same thing that happened when I when I recognized that on the Dr. Umar panel as I'm up there and we're talking about black issues everybody was okay with the fact that like yeah, I was disagreeing with him. Yeah, I spoke with Dr. Umar on a panel like a couple of months back on Fox Soul. And what was so funny about that was that Dr. Umar did not clock my transness. And in the midst of this interview, Dr. Umar called me a black queen, a beautiful black queen on a couple of different occasions. Till he knew. And so after the interview, because I got him together, right? Because it wouldn't have mattered if I was just a nobody on the panel who didn't have much to say. But because I was able to, like, come up with thought processes and all of the things, now it's a problem and we want to know who this bitch is. Because who is she? And how does she, who, who is she to try to get our king together? And so once the research starts getting done and they realize that I'm trans, now we're not talking about the fact that you made points. Now we're not talking about the fact that we just disagree with what you were saying. Now we want to dismantle it and we want to say Fox Soul and, you know, the people on the panel tricked Dr. Umar. But what does that have to do with the fact that he still said what he said and I still said what I said? Why Why are we now making this about him saying that I was beautiful and all of these other things when the conversation was centered around whether or not we felt like black men were under attack in community. But the problem is, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I think think that the problem is with a lot of people in community is that they love the, uh, the, they love the ability to be able to, like you said, separate the idea of your blackness because then it gives them the right to treat you the way that they would treat white people if they could, right? Queer black people are the closest that some black people are going to get to being able to be disrespectful in the way that they would to white people if they could. And so they take all of that aggression, the same aggression that you wanted to give Sarah, that you work with, your, your, your 
uppity ass manager the same aggression that you wanted to give your grandpapa who's been racist since the day that you were born and hates your black little face the same aggression that you wanted to give your seventh grade teacher all of that comes to black queer people because you know if you say that to sarah she's gonna have your ass locked up you know yeah. if you smack so and so you're gonna be in trouble but if you smack me everybody's gonna give you a hand clap of praise because fuck that faggot and that's yeah. the shit that i don't like yeah they do the same I thing to their kids it's, it's, yeah, I think it's I think it's easier to alienate, you know, something I realized about people is especially because I went I, I was surrounded by white people for a lot of time by being in America, white schools, West Virginia, Ohio, all of this. So what I realized about white about not just pe just people when when they want to when they want to discriminate against particular kinds of people, because it's easier. Let's be honest. It's easier to be a shitty person than it is to be a good person. It's easier to say fuck entire quadrants of people. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know it. And it becomes easier when you could have the plausible by the deniability of sitting on your foolishness and never knowing those people. And so I think that is a lot of the impetus between alienating people. Like, I don't want them in the room because on some level, it is a, it is, it is a fear of having these beliefs checked, right? And I think you see there when it comes to, like, their masculinity, their sexuality, all the different things about um, uh, that they're holding on to. What they're really sick about is the idea. It's like, I need to keep I need to keep black trans women out the room or I need to be told this so I can move in a particular negative, you know, treatment from the beginning, because otherwise, God forbid it be revealed. I think this black trans woman was beautiful. God forbid. What does that say about me and my sexuality that I was treating like? And I think that is the foolishness that they come into, into, you know, and it's like, all right, it's easier. It's easier if I just keep them out and then I can create a narrative. If you never have trans people at the table, then it's easier to get the narrative you want to believe about them and what you want to say trans people are pushing and to get up the agenda not nonsense but if you just be in a room with trans people casually there and that's not presented to you and then you are forced to realize you are interacting with and discussing and engaging with trans people the same way you would anybody fucking else in the black community because they are like everybody else in the black community that dismantles your whole bullshit so my question is who gonna throw the first brick and where are we throwing them at <laughs> <laughs> Who's, I can't throw I no brick, baby, but I'll put them underneath all four of these tires I got outside. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm I'm here for brick throwing. I'm here for, but the thing about it is that, I, and I think Deshaun, I don't know if you remember, like way, 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 way back when when we had that conversation um, with Lord Jesus. I don't forgot the man name. With Justin, but we had a con Justin yeah, yeah, yeah. underneath it all as as black people and as a black community. I hate to do the old black men are the problem thing or cishet black men are usually the problem thing. But a lot of the time, it's hard to decide where you're going to throw the brick when at the end of the day, the people that we want to protect most are cis black men. But the people that are fucking us up the most are cis black men. So it's like if I throw this brick and I hit Dante in the head, I have to then turn around and not only pick him up from the brick that I threw, but pick him up from the ass whooping that he caught from the police unjustifiably, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, at what point, like it, when Marsha threw that brick and when Sylvia and, and Stormy and all the rest of the folks was like, okay, we with you, there was one common enemy. There was one common goal. There was one understanding. As Black queer people, if we decide that we're going to attack our attackers, that looks a little different because now the police have justification to say, well, the people that we're attacking are the same people that y'all are attacking. And so shouldn't it not be justified? Why do y'all want to stop whooping their ass when they whooping y'all ass? And that is where the problem comes but, in for me. This is, this is to me why it is so imperative that we actually have a really grounded understanding of policing, of violence, of anti-blackness. I, I, I keep bringing this back here, but that's my bag. Because I think that like people really, people really do believe what you just said, Hope, like, oh, well, what's wrong with the police murdering black people or, or black men if black men are the ones who are murdering y'all or black men are the ones who are violating y'all, right? And it's like, Babes, the issue with that is that black men are, none of this is innate to them, right? This mm -hmm. is something that's being taught through various systems, as some sociologists to call it, social institutions, where, where they learn to, to police people, to dominate people, because policing exists, right? And policing yeah, can only exist because of the slave, right? All of it always leads back to slavery. And we don't wanna, we don't right. wanna sit with that truth, but th that's the reality. And so it's like, yeah, when I pick up the brick, I'm I'm going to start with the police officer and I hope Dante is watching to be clear like babes 
the police officer is the one that's getting hit up in the head right now. But if if there's not a shift that you make, you're next, right? <laughs> right. Because because I recognize that I have a lot more more grace for for black folks writ large, <clears throat> not just black men to be clear, but black folks writ large because I recognize the fact that a lot of how we are showing up in in these in these spaces is because we've been taught through various white structures how we're supposed to engage each other and i'm saying we as black folks collectively um and so for me it's like part of the brick that i'm about to throw right now and and what i always feel the the need to like (laughs) that i always feel the need to talk about in all these conversations is the spread of protestant christianity right Mm. Folks, you know, our communities are are very reluctant to hear that their relationship to Christianity um, is, is not something that has to be interrogated. Right. But the very basis on which this Supreme Court ruling stands is that this woman has a right to not accept people's lifestyles because of her religious beliefs, right? Conservative religious practices are playing a significant role in what laws are being passed and what laws are being repealed. But that is the very foundation of America itself, right? The spread of Protestant Christianity is what led to and what allowed for chattel slavery to exist in the first place. So for me, it's like, I, I'm all, that's my brick. I'm going to, I'm throwing the brick at the motherfucking churches. Yeah. Hey. Cause, cause, <laughs> cause, cause they, cause our folks, you know, like at one point in time, sure. During the sixties, the churches was really getting things together and they was really provided for the people. They was like really, you know, giving folks some food, giving people some shelter, blah, 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 blah. Unless you're in a small rural area now, churches are not committed to those same practices and they haven't been for a very long time. And they especially are not committed. And even if they are right, to be clear, even if you are committed to those practices, you still got to go. I want to be clear that I am very much committed to destroying Christianity and all churches. And and honestly, religion, it's anyway. So I say all that to say I say all that to say that for me, it's like. I think that if we if we have an actual grounded critique in the pervasiveness of anti-blackness, it will always lead us to the spread of Protestant Christianity. It will always lead us to this as you know, a lot of the folks online love to hate on her. And I do have my critiques, but she ate down with this. This cis hetero patriarchy, imperialist, imperialist patriarchy that we live under where the bell hooks. Right. As long as we are living under that structure, we will always have something, something that a brick has to be thrown at. And, and, and I think that we have to get clear about that. And that's the importance of having a real grounded critique in, in anti-blackness. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that. that is oh, the church, the role. You know what I think is so incredibly frustrating about um, the fact that the church, the church and Christianity is so foundational to all this bullshit is again, it is really truly the one thing niggas are not trying to hear you. I'm, I'm, hey, you got the most educated scholarly nigga they know in every way, shape, or form. You could not tell them nothing else. There's nothing else. There's nothing else that I think as a people we could so consciously know was fed to us by our enslavers, by our colonizers. We historically know it was for the reason of keeping us okay with the slavery and still Niggas will yeah, but you to the death. To the I death. What it is. I got a question. Yes. Uh, I guess my question is exactly where do we start in uh, like addressing this larger culture? Deshaun, I really love that you uh, brought bell hooks into the room because one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking, hope when you were talking about uh, throwing the brick and hitting Dante in the head, uh, whatever name you use. But like is how Bell Hooks talked about the way that even like if you raise, for example, like a boy to be like anti-patriarchal, uh, they will go out into the world and be taught those very same lessons of patriarchy. So like it's a larger culture that teaches like boys to like separate themselves from their emotions and mm-hmm. not to practice uh, empathy for the other people in their community. Not that that's the set, because I know if a straight cishet man see this, I know how they how they get. Not that that's all cishet men, but like yeah. some cishet men, most cishet men, uh, uh, 
are taught to dissect themselves from their emotional selves. All cis head men. Yeah. Every single one of them. No. I'll say it. I'll say it. Yeah, yeah, look, because you know, I'm Some Italian. Ones, <laughs> I know, I know, but I'll Most say it. Hey, I was literally just kidding. Y'all, I'll be, I'll be tired of getting, getting dragged all day. It's I, get, I, get, I, get, I get it, and that's why I said it. You, Shaheem didn't say it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. But no, like they're taught to like really cut themselves off from their emotional um their emotional selves and that really impacts the way that we can even uh, operate in unity as a as a culture as a as a people. And I think like mm-hmm. the weakest link conversation always brings people up in arms, but if we really be keeping it a bean, if we really keep it a bean, where do we start to address that? <laughs> But we already are, and that's the reason why this conversation and conversations like this are even happening, right? The the movement uh, or the, first of all, what was so funny about it was that you saw so many cishet Black men talking about, but where's the Black boy joy? Y'all got Black girl magic. Y'all got Black girl this. Y'all got Black woman empowerment. Where's the Black, gr- where's Honestly, the black boy stuff? Throw the cishet straight, throw the cishet Black women um, in it, in it too. I must, I must say it as one, as one. It's true. You know it's true. It too, because it's we true. are the, hey, we right there, is lock, lock step on the you, bullshit. Okay, harbingers <laughs> of misogyny, homophobia. Access to said woman, uh, if she a date one. a bi man. They on the timeline talking about what's sassy right now. Don't it. wake that Get up. Don't it. wake that up. They yeah, on the y'all. timeline talking about what's sassy it's a preference. Right now. I'm go- I'm gonna say what what. This this gets people tight, and it might get some of y'all tight. The reality is, none of us are exempt from any of that because I mean, all of us, in many, all of us, in many ways, want to be gendered, yeah. right? Yeah. And the gendering that that we're desperately trying to hold on to plays a significant role in in why we are invested in these very gendered structures that are right. only allowed to exist because of white supremacy, because of anti-blackness. And that gets the girls upset. They're like, what do you mean? I, I meant what I said. That's what I said. And so Maybe. it's like, we can really, we can list off all, all, all the names, all the genders, all the, all the things. All of us are in, in different ways committed to these very same practices because none of all of, we're all being taught in the very same society. Right. We all watch the same TVs, listen to the same radio, listen, right. listen, watch the same media, grew up in the same religious households, grew up in the, in the very same um, education institutions, right? Like we're all being taught in different ways to, to, to think about these things in these particular ways. And yeah. That's that is why I think that despite whatever critiques are offered, that's why what Bell Hooks names as in this very like succinct way, right? Cis heterosexual imperialist patriarchy is very, very important because what she is telling us, what she's getting us to understand is that all of us are invested in this in, in this very same practice. She's the one that named that patriarchy is not exclusive to men. That patriarchy is 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 that is not a gendered experience, right? That those are her words. Despite the fact that the cis men love to be like, she was only her t- babes. She she said they it. Love she wrote that. that they not love me. How they get that out? Can we just talk about how they get that off in the first place? Because I know that lie. I'm really over because it's a bitch who reads bell hooks regularly. I don't know nobody else who try to humanize men more than bell. I'm not sure. Well, I'm like, I ain't read shit else trying to humanize. I was confused. Non reading niggas saying this shit about bell. They've never read no bell hooks. They (laughs) align their identity. They align their identity with patriarchy. They feel like they are patriot they literally a, a lot what i think that's a lot of people they refuse to see that it, it is we're literally living under this umbrella this construct and that's why we're operating the ways that we are they feel like that is who they are that's our identity they align with it so deeply that if you try to rip you try to strip them away from it or you dare at least challenge them not even challenge them ask them ask somebody why they believe what it is they believe and they will go crazy yeah. It's the same thing with Christianity. They feel so tied to that in their in their essence and their identity that they can't even sit and look at the facts, look at the knowledge that we literally have proof of, and be like, "Oh, maybe I actually don't fully believe this. I was told to. Maybe I'm po- I'm just so happen to be indoctrinated by these things." They they've done such. Oh, white supremacy has done such a good job of making people feel like, "No, this is who you are in the system. This is, system isn't just." 
created. If this is mm-hmm. just how things are. And when you believe that you can't deconstruct a system, you believe that you can't construct a new one. So yeah. It's like while you're trying, I think in my process of deconstructing, like what you were saying to Sean is like, there's still aspects where it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm tied to j- be, j- being gendered or I'm tied to sexuality. I'm tied to the, the definitions of certain things because we're still living within the system, but trying to deconstruct within the construct that is still happening can be so difficult. But some people aren't even ready to even acknowledge that it is shit. Shit is made up. I say this all the time. I'm like, this is really made up. Like, yeah, we did right. not have to have six people make a decision for a whole right. entire country. Yeah, but we've decided. Uh, we've just decided that it's not a problem i I think that that's the thing though like once the majority says that this is the thing that we've all agreed upon is the least problematic it is hard to step away from the flock because now you don't want to be the person at the high school dance that's in the middle of the floor while everybody else is like waiting to see when the when the right song or when the right teacher is gonna come and embarrass themselves and make it okay and the problem with it is that like nobody who they deem as important enough has made queerness or black queerness and and the the culmination of those thoughts okay and so until then i'm gonna hold on to my flocks mentality of thinking that y'all are weirdos y'all are the days and the dems and the the weird people and i am normal (laughs) and until you know until i guess back in the day lil wayne says that it's okay to wear you know skinny jeans and eat pussy or until you know the right rapper of the new age says i'm gonna date this trans woman or be this gay queer man and it's not frank ocean who we were already questionable about in the first place people are going to continue to feel like it's not okay to do the things that they already feel perfectly fine about a lot of people don't give a fuck about who you having sex with or how you show up they just feel like if they have an affirmative opinion it puts them in the same category as it puts us and rather than be othered they would rather fall in line with things that they don't even agree with is I have conversations sometimes with like I have a close I have a close friend who who literally called me once because a, a, a woman who's in a relate who was sleeping with a woman privately but God forbid to them they acknowledge any level of not straight and the real issue the real issue was never about the relationship the sexual attractions the anything but not wanting to be a part of the group. You know what I mean? Not wanting to be a part of the group, not wanting to care, wanting to be, you know, separated and not really wanting to explore that. And I and I think I I think that uh, is is a big premise. I also think um, another issue is the fact that like what you said, hope is the fact that somebody else always has to speak up. I think that is rooted in in anti in anti blackness in the same way, because race, race, just like this, especially when it comes to the black queer community in specific if they're the only things in American society treated as though expertise, actual experience, like anything else, having more experience or expertise with something makes you the most qualified to hear from it. But when you are a queer person, you are a black person, that is the first thing that makes it delegitimized. Like they would not listen to Hope give 19 points on all the things. But if I go and I say one of quote the Hope's points loosely, loosely quoted viral, they love it now. You know what I mean? This is black woman said it. So we going to hear it. And that, and that is I, that is the that is the most dangerous thing I think because it gets us back to the problem you said it like the Lil Wayne's of this like Malcolm X and them always talked about that the dangerousness of of the celebrity if you need people other people to speak up for people who are not mm. the experts who are not the people who experience who are not this of course you're gonna get fucking misinformation or half ass conversations and discourse and not really get the info and I think what's really dangerous about that is I think people like to think especially I'm a lawyer people love to think that you know you become a lawyer because that's how you think you're going to change shit. And I'm like, why do y'all think that? Where in the book, where you feel that way? Like a lawyer is a harm reductionist at best on the best day, like at at best. But I'm like, a lawyer is fighting within the confines of a system. They are working within that system. They can't change anything. And I always, I'm like, to me, education, like in terms of what we tell people, what we teach people, has obviously the biggest impact because I was always going to be a lawyer, but I wasn't always going to be this kind of lawyer. Like if I didn't read from Angela Davis and my college professors and whoever in college, imagine me putting this same kind of intense energy towards Coonan or prosecution or whatever it is, which easily could go that direction. And I think it, so I think it has a lot to do with what we say. Like, for example, like how I first learned of Deshaun is I have belly to the beast when Deshaun told me about my fat phobic ass without me knowing it. <laughs> like, I was like, I read it and I'm like, mm. 
Ooh, oh, bitch, you did not know that. I was like, let me find out. Like, learn so many things. And you can see my annotations in my notes. And I think it's like a general unwillingness our society has to one, like we take trying to share information is an indictment. Like I think that, and I think that's how people see the LGBT community in general. They act like the LGBT community is trying to inconvenience them, to stress them out, to give them problems. They never look at it as like, oh, I'm I'm trying, I'm trying to give you the information to better yourself, myself, all of us. It would help us. Instead, it's like they're trying to stress me out. They're trying to cancel me. They're trying to give me problems. They're trying to this. And that is a dangerous thing. Uh I just want to add one more layer to it too. One. Yes. Beautifully said. Um, Two, I think one thing that's really important for us to keep in mind is like the self-protective nature of a lot of these institutions through violence. Like when people do speak up, like it is oftentimes met with like harsh, I mean, very harsh violence um, or death. Like, and I think that conditions a lot of people to shy away from being the person I think Hope said it in the it, it, at, at the school dance in the middle of the room by yourself. Like that violence is really like inherent. Like whiteness is violence. Let's start with that. But like okay. uh, that that violence is really like I'm trying to measure my words, but it's beat into like us as a people. And I think like yeah. it's no coincidence that a lot of the times, like uh, when queer people speak up it is often met with like that that much apprehension because that violence is something that is in, innate in and how society operates here um specifically in this context and i think uh like keeping that in mind the self-protective nature of patriarchy um is is so so essential to being able to maneuver through it and to make changes within it because yeah we can all like all of us here matter of fact all of the people I know here t- at some point has like been on the receiving end of violence simply from like using using our voices. So I don't know. I think that's really important to keep in mind, too. People are scared. Yeah. Um, and again, I have to be the therapist in the room, but people are people are terrified, which is why I think a lot of pe- uh, black people specifically and the, just a layer because it's like a lot more. And they're, not wrong. and they're not wrong to be terrified, honestly, because the, yeah. like. The LGBT community, specifically the Black LGBT, LGBTQ community, are the violence against them are the most legitimized. But like it's the, like you when you think about it, right? Because when it comes to the white queer community, they have whiteness. They have the protection of whiteness or whatever in a large and what their experiences within whiteness is entirely different. But if the black queer community is left fucking hanging because the white queer community is not coming to to center, to center, to care about, to take those issues, to in any way acknowledge that. And the black community is saying, fuck you. You know what I mean? You're not black. So where where do you turn? And I think that's not a coincidence why the the violence against Black trans women is so high. It's not a coincidence why you see uh, legislation and these things disproportionately impact Black queer community, because it's easy to do it, which is why I think in general, why you see so many attacks against the trans community nationwide, but specifically who gets the brunt of that are Black trans people, because mm-hmm. there's so much less people, because it's been right now, it's like, oh yeah, they're other. There's uh, they're other. They're you know, nobody, nobody has to do it. Or it's treated like Whatever. That's why. That's the reason why, statistically, trans issues. People are not voting on it for or against one way or another. Like whether Republican, they're not voting. Anything could happen. The Democrats, the liberals, the level and the right. Like, you know what I mean. But nothing. Uh, one way or the next, they treat it as like this isn't even an electoral issue for us. You know what I mean? It's an intellectual exercise, something for them to field around, engage in all this harmful rhetoric without any real level of of knowing who this really impacts. Because it's a litmus test. It's not about actually seeing, you know, how these people's lives are going to be affected. It's about seeing how the social order is going to react to it, right? Because if I can see whether or not y'all are going to go, you know, ham or come out the bag on us about this, then we're going to take our time with it. We're not going to roll out all of this at one time. But if y'all are going to say, fuck them with us, now we're going to speed up the process a little bit. And I think that that's what people fail to realize is that this, the reason why you're seeing trans stuff so much is because it is a test of the, of the broadcast system. Yeah. They're just trying to see if y'all are paying attention and what y'all are paying attention to. Okay, so when we bring this up and it affects white queer people mm, y'all might pick it up for a day it might trend for an hour but y'all ain't really biting on that but if we tell y'all that some the some black trans girl said something about aretha franklin y'all are talking about it for two weeks got you yeah. right if, yeah. if we kill 
if we kill a black woman in her car in broad daylight, it might trend for an hour or two unless the right celebrity picks it up. But if we kill a black nigga, it don't matter what the fuck we kill him. Y'all going 10 toes down. So we're going to start killing more black women, right? And that's what we've seen. But the problem is that the litmus test works. It shows them where there are chinks in the armor. And every single time we show them what we don't care about, all they do is nitpick. Boom. And then before you know it, we ain't got nothing but a vest and a helmet. And we wondering where the fuck the rest of the armor went. And it's because you were paying attention to your feet and you were paying attention to that little vest. And whole time, bitch, they was working on the legs and knees and you missed it. Oh, God. That was beautiful. Except when the, wow. except when the nigga is, is, is trans, right? When it when when the nigga, when, when it's a trans man or it's, it's a non-binary person who they can't really name, nobody wants to rally around that. <laughs> nobody wants to hop in the yeah. streets around, around those folks, right? No, I know all kind of I know all kind of black trans people that have been killed or died in the last several years. I've been a lot of protests. I've not been one one themed around that. I've never seen that be what's the trending issue. I've never seen that be what all the op ads about like at at except when it's being done by other trans people, right? Like yes, mm. yes. Like, or when it's being done to tell you that we're co-opting the movement. Right. Mm. So if the movement is about blackness and if the movement right. is about us getting free from the police, it doesn't matter. Tony McDay got shot in broad fucking daylight. I was, thinking and there of, were, I was literally about to say Tony McDay. There were several videos of not just trans people. The first couple of rollouts of these videos were people in community that we can assume were not a part of the community that said Tony was in his business. He was going through something but he wasn't bothering nobody. And these are community members that were saying this. But they found out he was trans and all of a sudden we don't give a fuck. And then yeah. in the midst of all of this, we were trying to have dual spaces where we could talk about George Floyd and Tony and um, the other Olay, like all of those people. But the second that they found out that the other Olay was queer and that Tony was a trans man and not a black cis man, now it's, oh, y'all are trying to call out the movement. That's not what we're here for. It's not about, but they were both black. Yeah. Yes, we're going to bring the, the, the flags because we want to represent them and what they stood for, but they were also black people. So you got black queer people that are showing up to these marches and feeling like I can't bring my whole self while I'm trying to support people that would have likely killed me. Like, it sucks that as a black queer person, as a black trans woman, I'm going to go and march for George, but I don't know if George would have actually been a person that would have stood up for me. But here I am talking about justice for this man. And this man might have been one of the people that was up in my comments talking about I'm a man and I need to die. When I am mm. guilty. Christina. I was just going to say, I've been thinking about Auntie Harriet Tubman this entire time. And that's why she had to go for a reason. Because if we're talking about throwing bricks and if Dante has to get hit in the head, well, I get, well, move out the way. You know what side <laughs> to be on at the end of the fucking yeah. day. And if some bitch made shit. It's just some bitch made shit. It really is like when we're talking about people being afraid because we they can see the violence that you know we'll deal with, or people who are more visible, more outspoken, who don't have the privilege of being able to hide behind some shit, even if they do agree with these with with these right um, agree with like trans rights and queer rights, even if they do want to learn, even if they are interested. Like it's a privilege to be able to hide behind that veil, but there are so many people who cannot hide behind that veil. So you're going to sit and watch them deal with the violence just because that you you know at the end of the day, you don't have to. That's yeah. some bitch made shit. And it's some white supremacist ass shit. And it's shit that white people do that black, the black community constantly tells white people, you hide behind white privilege. You hide behind this privilege. We know you it. We know understand that it. Been, we understand it because we say it all I the time. I didn't get the you finish, know, but you, I do agree that it's bitch made. Just want to uh, clarify. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, and I know. I know we know that. And I know people don't want to hear that, but it is. And it's like, you can be afraid. Yes. But it's literally not going to stop the violence from happening right. to these people. And it's not going to stop the violence happening to you. Because what people right. don't understand is it trickles down. You think black trans people can be attacked and you, your reality as a black cis man ain't going to be attacked, honey? Like, you, you right. think yeah. that that shit don't align? Right. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say this. And speaking on the afraid and I guess the trauma, I guess... I don't know, Hope was just preaching over there because I, I think about this whole conversation, I've been a little quiet because it's just even hard for me to even have these kind of discussions and these conversations because I think that I'm, I'm getting these all kinds of flashbacks and I'm getting these feelings of, of 
fear and trauma that Shaheem has been speaking on, which I feel like are all very, very valid. And I'm thinking like, damn, am I bitch made? Because I, for a minute, I think I've been a little frozen in time and like, you know, how do I say this? I know it's, it's kind of hard because I've been living like, oh my, like, honestly, like I've tried to do my best. So I'm just waiting for my time to come. And I'm, I want to get out of that. And I want to throw a break. And I want to start a mo- get in the movement, do the movement. And I'm like, what do we do? What, what are our steps? What, a, what is, what, what's going to work? What's going to work? And like, how do we not censor the Constitution? Like that they've been trying to decide our rights on. How do we cen- not censor this, you know, state of white supremacy and you know the American industrial complex and and the machine that it is? So I'm I'm very yeah. You know, this is a very, very... Uh... Can, I ask, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you think living visibly as a queer person in and of itself is like I was revolutionary? About, I was about to say that. That's revolutionary, I love. I was living... That ain't no bitch made shit. It definitely is, re- it is revolutionary. Yeah, but thank you. That ain't no bitch made shit. It, it yeah. really is. Yeah, like, JC, I was literally about to say that when you said that. I was like... First of all, I think something people need to forget, like, remember, especially when it comes to, like, Blackness in general, but, like, the added layer of being Black and queer is you don't get a choice. You know what I mean? Like, your entire existence is political, right? Like, you have no fucking say in it, right? You go out in the world and you are involved in in, in this, right? So you there's already that. Like, maybe, you know, everybody else might get to choose whether or not they do this or become an ally and support it and, you know, it becomes that. But you don't get a choice. That's one. Two, I think that being said, in not getting that choice and already having to live that existence and being part of this very politicized mm-hmm. existence... I think joy is important. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think, I think it's very important. What you do is that. It is a part of that. When I thought, I'm, when you said it just now, I was like, you know, I think you, the the bigotry, the bigotry that we exist in, in this world that has been pervasive in our entire world, the anti-blackness, the homophobia, all of this is not there because it's the strongest. It's not like, it doesn't survive. It's not pervasive because it makes the most sense or mm. because it's it, because yeah. it's the, the, the hardest to knock down. It's the flimsiest. It's there because it's what people see the most. It's what's been common. It's what's been centers. It's what's been pushing. Everybody else has been pushed to the outskirts and it's what's been other. There's a reason why they want to ban books. There's a reason why they want to stop visibility of queer people. They want to take it out of your face because it makes it easier to do that. There's a reason why prisons are put far away where you can't just visit and you can't just go. So the fact that you're not just visible, you're not just walking around being queer, but you're walking around videoing it for the rest of fucking us. You're showing us all kind of queer people. You are making that normal to people who otherwise get away with doing this by othering it and making it into a unicorn and all that. So you okay. are doing something rebel. I just watched Period. you in queer <laughs> outside in front of like a government building the other day. You are doing literally amazing things towards that. And I, th- and I think we all, we all forget because we do know the magnitude of what we're up against. But you know, last night I was watching something and my friend, my, my boo, he was next to me and he was like, Oh, I had a, 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 like, I was watching something. I was actually, I was watching a Why Left TYT video on their transphobia. And my boo was like, I heard someone say that the other day and I knew it was like some bullshit, like some transphobic bullshit. And he was like, I knew that was some bullshit, but I didn't know how to say, like, I didn't know how to defend it. I didn't know how to articulate it. So he's like, give me this link. I can send that. And I'm like, that's the things we don't get to see, right? Like, I'm Mm. like, Christina, you famous for real. They talking about what you saying in real life. You really agitating people, getting discourse going though. And that's real life. Like I see hope all over the goddamn place. Like it's being there. It's being visible. It's saying these things. It's like the way I told Deshaun, I never met Deshaun, never talked to Deshaun, but I already read all the belly of the beast, you know? So you are all doing revolutionary things by even because the average person is not speaking at all. You know what I mean? They are scared. They are this. And just, you know how many people you probably don't know that you've impacted to like live in their Mm -hmm. truth, which is in and of itself is a part of revolutionary conduct. So I want to be clear, queer joy is important and and putting joy out there is important. Yeah. I want to uh, just add uh, one more layer. Yes. (laughs) No, 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 about the queer joy. I think that it's like, uh, just to even like, bring it bring it back down to the science right uh bilateral stimulation is like a huge part of like uh processing and metabolizing trauma and Mm -hmm. like a two-step for example that's bilateral stimulation a lot of the like the things that like we do for our leisure 
are like really important uh like just culturally i think we naturally gravitate towards things that help us to metabolize and work through and process trauma enjoy how we dance like how we like uh express love for one another that is a huge part of that so like that cannot be like downplayed at all it is a huge part of what i do and why it is important for you to show up and like bring bring that portion to it it's not all doom and gloom just putting that out there um and you know it's important for us not to get uh caught up in that trap too as we are working through a metabolizing trauma not only on an interpersonal level but on like a systemic uh level because yeah. it is the our our happiness uh contributes to us having enough energy in life to to address a lot of these issues and mm. yeah so just want to give you that love too because like don't don't ever downplay that that is a huge part i don't of downplay life. it but i do just this conversation specifically it, it does bring yeah. back like flashbacks and feelings and fear you know just what, all the shit that we've just lived through and experienced and i guess i have tried to create that escape but it definitely there's a part of me that I used to be that I'm not so much anymore. And I'm just like, y'all are just like, you know, y'all in the ringer, y'all, y'all in the, so uh, are it's you. amazing. You're I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, I'm sorry. I know. No, I don't want to turn this, I don't want to turn this into like a, 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 you know, a pickup thing, but I definitely want to acknowledge that like everything y'all have saying like really, really powerful and it's, I just been no, no. Deshaun, you want to do it. Deshaun, you want to do it, or you want me to do it? Because I see you want to do it, so you want to do it. No, you go ahead. 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 What do What do y'all want to do? <laughs> because I, this, this, because this is a, this is a tool of the white supremacy, and it's also a tool of the culture, right? To make us feel like what we're doing is not enough, right? and I think that that's the thing too. It's the 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 oppressor programming our people to making us feel like the way that we show up is an inconvenience, right? Mm -hmm. And if we are not showing up in a very particular way, then our own community turns against us and says like, well, I'm I'm at the forefront. I organized three marches last year and Mm -hmm. I got Pepsi to sponsor my ball and I got so-and-so to sponsor a give back Mm -hmm. and I got da-da-da-da-da-da-da. It's this need for hyper visibility and hyper sponsorship to say I am this because these people know about it. And it's not those folks that are creating change like no tea no shade it, it, I, i'm very honest about the fact that hope used to be in the trenches girl hope used to be the bitch slapping the police at the front of the line hope used to be the girl getting arrested every other weekend i'm not that bitch no more because i don't have to be right there are times in our lives where the shift has to happen you do the work so that the people coming behind you can learn from your example not so that you can stay in the trenches for the rest of your life my goal in doing that work was for me to dig right so that i can be at some point in a position where i'm a where I'm a Laverne or Angelica or one of those people because, bitch, I want to live my soft life and sit in my penthouse in the middle of Manhattan, too. But the thing about that is I'm not going to feel and I'm not going to let you make me feel bad about it once that shift starts to happen because I put in the man hours and I'm making space to pass the mic. At this point, JC, you feel like you're at, you're in your past the mic era and there is nothing wrong with that. The work is still being done and it's getting done, but it's not requiring the labor that you used to put in and i think for anybody listening to this don't think that because the work feels like it's getting easier don't think because your wardrobe to show up to the the moments are are changing that you're no longer valuable to the movement that you put like my things at the end of the day if marcia and sylvia and all of them were still alive first of all no not even if Miss Majors is still alive. Is Miss Majors still walking around here with picket fence and like picket signs? And No, she's living her soft life from the work that she did before. And we are the people that are carrying that out. So for anybody that feels like your evolution is a downgrade to the movement, bitch, stop. Like, stop that shit and stop allowing one, these, these new babies and these fucking white supremacists to make you feel like unless you're out here on your hands and knees begging hey. and scraping and scrimping that you are not doing the work. Bitch, the work has already been done, and all I'm doing is sustaining it and make sure that the babies know how to get where they got to go safely. That's it. A word. I, 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 whew, let's breathe. For, <laughs> let's breathe it in for a second. <laughs> that was a lot. Mm. Hope, are you running for president? I, I, I want to add. Can we do that? I hope y'all want to run for president. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm out of the dragon bookie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just making my commitments clear. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm crying. <laughs> but no, I just want to add a, a caveat to that to say that you know I I really love this I I love this conversation because. As someone who, and, and Hope knows this, I mean, Shaheem, I think you also know this too, but as someone who for a decade has been outside running from police, guns pointed in their face, right? Like building on the ground, being threatened by secret service, right? Like who has mm. been who has been outside, right? My commitment to, to how I show up looks different right I, I know i don't feel committed in the same ways to running from police in the streets unless unless it's it's a particular strategy right yeah um but my commitment to the movement has not changed and i think that is to me that feels like the most important piece because a lot of people will get to a place where and and i don't have to name names because we know the names right we know that we know the names of the people who have who have built entire lives right off the back of the movement actually i will name names i don't give a fuck you know we have the patrice colors and we have the sean kings right we have the tamika mallory's we have the derays right people who have oh. built entire <laughs> hello you know the big I, mean, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't i don't i don't give no no, no fuck. Gonna say, i'm not gonna say that nobody I don't give no fucks. You get right? me. You some of the names. It's, no, it's no tea, no shade, no pink lemonade. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a name the things as they are. Right? We know that people have used the movement as a catalyst to, mm. to, to live big lives to steal from folks, so that they have that they sit on top of millions of dollars. Right? That they have money and access and resources that folks do not have. Right? And I think that that's because one, folks are not in community with people or they're in community with people who have the same commitments as them, right? Um, but are, are also not reassessing their commitments to the struggle. And for me, right, it looked like, sure, I might not be outside every every day with y'all running from police, but I do have a mean media and calm strategy, right? I do know how to write up a manifesto. I do know how to make sure that I'm bringing the the words the voices from folks on the ground into the writing that i'm producing that helps to create a narrative that matters for folks who are on the ground right my commitment has not changed how i show up has changed and i think mm. that's very important um because people they think that when they people do this sort of this sort of thing that to me feels very like cognitive dissonance where they're like you know I'm I'm moving into a different iteration of the struggle, but their commitments don't look the same, right? They're not committed to folks on the ground. They're not they're not listening to people who are on the ground. They're not engaged with people on the ground, and then they wonder why folks are like calling them out for being celebrity or celebrity adjacent, or are calling them out for not having any real commitments to folks who are producing the very real like um work that's happening to be able to make make space for any type of revolution that's going to happen in the first place um so i wanted to name that because i think that's a very important caveat and also name i don't think of myself or as my work as revolutionary right um same, same, i think I, I, I show up in in whatever capacity i have as somebody who gives a fuck and as somebody who is wanting to move us closer to revolution right and and I'm yeah. and I mean revolution not as something for us to look back on, but revolution as something that does not have a promise of being on the other side, right? Revolution that that says that all I know is that this world is fucked up, and if it means that we got to end this shit, I don't know what happens after that, but I know that this shit got to end, right? That's what I'm trying to move us closer towards, and. I don't think that any of the work that I'm doing and that many of the people are doing right now is revolutionary because we're not getting no closer to that. But what I do know is that we are in a dying empire, right? We are we are experiencing what it means to be living on the tail end of an empire that has existed for far too long. And so whatever we can do to show up in, in, in our abilities, right, whatever it may look like, is what I think we should be doing um, mm. until we get to a point where we can actually be revolutionary. So I wanted to say that because, you know, I won't get into it. It's nothing no shade, but some some of the folks be having me fucked up sometimes, and I have to be clear that 
I do not think about myself or, or my work as revolutionary. I do think of it as clarifying. I do think of it as something that's in relationship to being on the ground. I do think of it as something that's driven by, that is pos made possible because of my relationship to being outside, right? That's and, beautiful. and I think that it's important because it only happens because I'm in community with people who also have those same commitments. Yo, oh, on, on, baby. a word. I've had people have a problem when I say that, like, oh, I am not a revolutionary and I've never identified as something that is very wild. I always say I am a harm reductionist at the very best, like, in, especially in my lawyer capacity. Because, um, you know, listen, my 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 black lawyer icon, my girl, Audrey Lord, uh, has always put it to me as there are no new pains. You know what I mean? There are no... Uh, this is a discourse that has existed. Everything I'm saying, somebody has said before, there are just new ways to make your ideas felt. And that's all I'm trying to do. I tell people all the time, I'm always aware of how much like <laughs> people don't read and white America ain't familiar with nothing because it ain't nothing I, I nothing I've ever said or espoused was not educated and told to me by a black person that's come before me. And you will go say it and people will act like you put something novel into the world. And I'm like, no, no. The way I see it personally for me is I'm I'm just a bitch who talks all day. I would if you didn't. If <laughs> I was I've been running my mouth since '93, and I will run my mouth till I die. And so I realized I'm like, listen, right. in a different world. I would love to go be a city girl, go be cute, go mind my business, go nibble. I'm like, y'all think I want to talk about bigotry, but y'all, it's just it's that it is the reality of this world that we live in. And so for me, I was like, you know what? If I'm going to run my mouth anyway, when I realized that, oh, people like to listen to me, they will listen, they will read, they'll whatever if I go up in the media. I'm like, well, I was going to talk anyhow. So I might as well talk about something that services the liberation of people. And that's how I see it. I'm like, if I have a platform, it's not that I think anything that I can or will ever do is revolutionary. It's what I believe is that. I, allowing me, cannot push the needle by myself. I can't push nobody's needle by myself. But if there are a bunch of other people like me, same mind, same ideas, other black people, all these queer people that we can put there, if all of us can talk, that makes a big, big difference. So I'm like, you know what, if y'all gonna listen to me, I have a platform, let me platform the views I want and see how I can help us in the slightest bit move towards what is our larger shared vision, but not because I have it fucked up. And I think, cause I'm always like, Hey, yo, the real revolutionaries are dead or political prisoners. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. So yeah. Thank you. You wonderful people for coming to join me today. I'm sorry. I have to say this. I have to say this. It's I, have to say this. Yes. It, it took yes. me, it, I couldn't get my mic off mute fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you said that because Folks, <laughs> <laughs> say it, say it. Folks be walking around here, you know, a lot of the people on Twitter thinking that they have valid criticisms of, of people who have put in real work when they haven't done shit. And I want to be clear, yes. I want to be clear, there is something very important and significant about digital organizing. Digital yes. organizing does not start and stop on Twitter. And if you have not put in work with community, I don't actually give a fuck about what you have to say because the reality is that none of us are doing revolutionary work, right? This, when we, when we go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow, we will still be in the same fucking America that has not shifted. The empire will not have fallen, right? And, and to me, there is, the revolutionary work starts when we start to crumble all this shit. That's when I know that we're doing revolutionary shit. In this moment, we're building capacity for, for a revolution to get to whatever that experience is, right? And I think that there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. There's nothing wrong yeah. with, with being clear about that. And this, this, this idea that everything that we, that we do has to be, or in some way already is revolutionary, to me, all that it really shows to me is that we romanticize revolutionary aesthetics in a very particular way that re that remove us from any real context of revolution. And all of that has to do with how we've been indoctrinated into wanting to, even those of us who, who, who have a, a, a grounded um, or a deep understanding of these systems, right? We have these, this, com this commitment, this desire to still being able to experience 
a life wherein we are gendered or wherein we have access to, to certain amounts of money or wherein, yeah. right, where we have access to, to the very things that we're critiquing, right? And that desire is what keeps us from any possibility of revolt, mm. right? So but, what I'm committed to is is the undoing of these desires so that we can get to a revolution. Mm. But until then, let's be clear, none of this shit is revolutionary. It's preparation for the revolution. And that's what matters. Hey. Oh, it's a, oh. it's a cishet he him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, not a he him. <laughs> <laughs> they be the main ones. They be the main ones. They be the main ones. <laughs>